Fans have been asking for it for weeks, and on Wednesday night in Los Angeles, the Phoenix Suns finally flashed some consistent small ball. Thaddeus Young getting the nod over Drew Eubanks, Kevin Durant playing a little bit of center. On today's episode of Locked on Suns, how do those lineups need to work for the Suns, and how can they work for the Phoenix Suns? Let's go. You are Locked on Suns. Your daily Phoenix Suns podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And we're back. This is Locked On Phoenix Suns. We are part of the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Brendan Clean, a credentialed media member covering the Suns for the past seven seasons, a writer at Dime Magazine, the host of the Just Basketball Show, wherever you get your podcasts. And I also create written and video content for you Suns fans at the Locked On Suns Insiders community, which you can sign up for at the link in the show description below. Thank you for making Locked On Suns your first listen here on this Friday. If you're finding us for the first time or you haven't done so before, just hit that follow or subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching this show. Get a new episode in your feed every single Monday through Friday. Become an everydayer and get locked onto the Phoenix Suns from here till the rest of the season and beyond. Joining us as he does every week here on this Friday is Stephen Perjone. He is a writer over at Bright Side of the Sun a podcaster at PHNX, and a great Twitter follow. Just follow. giving Just away content, content to, the to the people these days, these days Stephen. Stephen. Um, Let's go ahead and just get to it. Small ball. The Phoenix Suns on Tuesday and Wednesday, I said Wednesday in the intro, but really on Tuesday as well, had to downsize quite a bit against the Clippers. Um, Frank Vogel called it their comeback lineup, I believe, and it did that. It did come back in both instances and was able to really score at a high level I'll just pass it to you to kick us off. What is, as you watch those lineups play, as you look around the league and see what works and what doesn't work and look at the personnel on this Suns team, what is the first thing that comes to your mind that will make or break these small ball units for the Suns? I think the first thing that comes to mind for me is to continue with the movement emphasis that's really been... uh, a huge part of the plot for this team in the post all-star break stretch of the regular season with the traditional lineups with reserve adjacent lineups with full out reserve lineups. The consistent thing that this team needs is movement around whatever primary action might be happening. And even more so when a primary action breaks down, when they get to the small ball layers, sometimes they get into a primary action more often than not, it's a small screen in and either ghosting, slipping or actually setting the screen to manipulate a matchup. From there, what's going on around that action? Because if nothing else is going off, nobody's cutting to pull in the defense and make them rotate. Things are going to be back at square one, which is stagnant, um, just going up against a brick wall in terms of the defense being set. Yeah. I uh, brought this up a little bit last night with the three-point attempts, and I think it's a good example. In this case, on in that game against the Clippers on Wednesday in L.A., a lot of them went in, so it looked all right. 18 of 50, but that 50 is a huge number for the Suns, and I think it speaks to what happens at times, which is just kind of, you know, what not to be uh, degrading of the talent of the guys, but it, it kind of looks like a, a high school basketball game, just, you know, passing it around the arc until somebody decides to shoot it. I, I know it's more complicated than that, but that's what, at its worst, it can end up being, and then you're just praying that relatively tested threes go in and it takes away some of the the impact of the spacing in the first place, right? It's like, okay, you can, I brought up the Celtics, right? Like maybe up until this year as they diversified their offense a little bit finally, but there were a lot of times you would watch that team the past few years and it was like, okay, but playing five out, playing a bunch of shooters, what does that really get you if you're just going to take threes anyway? You could take threes with a, guy, a center standing in the dunker spot and it probably is going to be a similar look, all things considered. So I think that's a great, that's a great shout out. And just before we get any further, I also wanted to get into the numbers in general here. So we're looking at a situation right now, the 1,200, almost 1,300 possessions that the Suns have played this year, Stephen, with both Nurkic 
and Eubanks off the court. Now, I will say there's some Udoka Azubuki minutes in there. There's some Chimezi Metu minutes in there. There's some Bull Bull minutes. You could call things small ball versus not small ball if you want, but I'm just going to use it that as the general category. They're actually getting outscored on the season in those in those lineups. And even if you include Azubuki being off the court just to say no pure center, no traditional center, it hasn't been a huge difference because obviously he doesn't play a lot. They're a little bit better, but still slightly negative. And so it's not a surefire thing to work, I guess is the point that I kind of want to make. Um, is there a game or is there a even a sequence or a, a stretch you remember from the season or even in the past two games that we've seen where you're like, that was a great example of what the opposite looks like where they're not just stagnant and taking threes for the sake of taking threes and actually working the offense a little more? Yeah, I think I believe this was, if my memory serves me correct, the second game against the Sacramento Kings where they were down <clears throat> uh, double digits. I think it was getting close to 20. And Frank Vogel cracked the glass on the emergency button, put the Kevin Durant save me lineup in. And they pretty much played across like three different iterations the entire fourth quarter. And obviously off the coattail of Durant, starting with his defense on Sabonis, they were able to get things done on that end. And that in turn enabled them to kind of establish a new flow into the fourth quarter, playing off of the strength of the defense and activity, getting to the open floor a little bit. And then all of a sudden in the half court, now they got their movement back. They got their flow. They got their rhythm. They're starting to cycle through options. It's not just Kevin Durant ISO touches or Kevin Durant mid-post touches. They're cycling through different things. They got cutters. And it, it was an onslaught that was entirely too much for the Sacramento Kings to, to you know, come back from. So I think that's the that might be the inception of realizing the true superpowers that the small ball lineup can have when they apply it appropriately and when they play to their strengths within it. Yeah, it almost, yeah. I don't know. This might be reading into it a little too much or something, but I do feel like the 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 mentality of the players out there when those lineups are in it just does feel like they play a little bit looser now that can be good and bad you mentioned some of the downside of it with the lack of energy kind of a one pass offense things like that but it feels like i don't know if this is fully true it feels like they play a little faster i think they know without Nurkic in there and kind of maybe just the fact that it's a lot of times where they are in a big moment trying to fight or they're coming back, they play with that sense of urgency. So you can't really separate it. We haven't seen it, let's say, start a game where things are just starting from scratch, but it definitely feels like that is there. And an easy way for a lot of, like, a lot of the things we say, get to the rim more or, you know, the lack of a point guard stuff. A lot of conversations to me, I think one of the big things you can always hit with this team is just get down to the floor, get down the floor faster. And I feel like we've seen that, especially when it is the Durant at center lineup that you were just talking about in 54 possessions. Remember we called it the laser lineup. It was a big deal at the beginning of the year. Even Vogel was getting into it and then it just disappeared. But that group with Gordon and, and with Durant at center, Still plus 31 per 100 possessions in 54 total possessions this season. like it, Or 54 minutes, sorry. Uh, it's still been really, really good every chance that it has gotten. And I hope we do see it more. But let's flip to the other side of the court, and I'll kick us off with another thing that I think you absolutely have to see when these lineups are out there on the court. Coming up next... First, today's show brought to you by Stitch Fix. You know that inf instant confidence boost you get from an outfit that makes you look really good? That is what you get with Stitch Fix. Easily upgrade your wardrobe this year with, with a professional stylist that helps you find new, on-trend favorites that work for you. Just give your stylist your size, style, and budget. Order boxes when you want and how you want, all without a subscription, subscription required. They then send you four just-for-you pieces, outfit recommendations, and pro styling advice. Send back what you don't like, but most of the time, your stylist sends you the right pieces that are in style, that fit you, that look good on you. It's easy with Stitch Fix. 
you don't like to shop, you don't want to put time and effort in yourself, you just maybe don't know what looks good. Well, Stitch Fix has you covered. If you don't love something, just send it back. Shipping returns and exchanges are always free. Style that makes you feel as good as you look. Get started today at stitchfix.com slash locked on. That's stitchfix.com slash locked on. Stitchfix.com slash locked on. Today's show also brought to you by eBay Motors. Steven and I were just talking about car troubles before we logged on. Unfortunately, we both have dealt with that recently. A lot of the time, eBay has you covered. If it's just something small or just a little update or a little tweak you need, eBay has you covered. You put your car in. It tells you which parts will work for your car. Usually very good prices, quick shipping, all that good stuff. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. And eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up. Superchargers, roof racks, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered with over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die. You'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. So keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. All right, let's keep the show rolling here, Steven. Uh, let's get to the defensive side of the floor. I think, I think that Kings that game Kings to game me to is a, a really good example of what has to happen on defense, right? I think Durant was really a, a standout in both cases when they went small against the Kings in the mid, middle part of the season, but he has to do a lot. He has to be able to handle the, the biggest player on the court on the opposing team, whether that's a post player, whether that's a, a role man, whatever the case is, there's going to be spots where he's, he's doing that. And then I think most importantly, it's just a matter of executing those crisp switches and fighting to contain your man. It sounds basic, but it is easier said than done. There's a reason teams don't do this a lot. It asks a lot of your players one-on-one. -on -one. It asks a lot of your communication, and that all needs to be really sharp if they're going to execute it. Yes, and I think a caveat to what you just mentioned, and even before I start with that, honestly, I feel like the defensive side of the ball might have been better for us to start with when they go small because yeah. literally everything is contingent upon if they can sustain on that end. If they can't, then Vogel just has to stick with having either Thaddeus Young or obviously Yusuf Nurkic on the floor. So uh, looking at the defense uh, specifically right now, <clears throat> I think looking at that Kings game that I mentioned, the caveat that I was uh, bringing up initially is that Royce O'Neal was not with the team yet. Yeah. And the spade in Frank Vogel's back pocket in terms of adding to that specific lineup is that Royce O'Neal can guard up and do so viably. So now that takes some of the toll when you're going with small ball renditions, that optionality that comes with it now. You don't always have to put Durant on Sabonis now. And I think we might even see this in the game on Friday, quite honestly, because both teams will need it. You can put Royce O'Neal there. Obviously, he's not going to shut him down, but he can make it hard for him to navigate to his spots. Obviously, the most important thing with somebody like Sabonis keeping him from his left hand, he can eat up those counters, take a shoulder to the chest or to the chin sometimes, take a charge, but generally flatten out his – powerful post moves and that's pretty much all you can ask for and then you work to grab rebounds from there which is the other big thing it's uh obviously containing the ball like you talked about i'll talk about switching in a little bit but the other big thing is rebounding and on the season like you mentioned in those lineups without uh azabuke or any of the true centers the Suns are grabbing 31.2 percent of the defensive rebounds available and that and now garbage time ranks is sixth percentile. So you talk about the effectiveness of your defense. They do a solid job getting initial stops. They play with a lot of activity. They get deflections and steals. They get blocks. If you're not coming away with the 50-50 balls and it's not a collective effort, you don't have Yusuf Nurkic that's moving the furniture down there now. It has to be gang rebound. And if it's not that, especially in the playoffs, it's not going to work to the optimized level that it could potentially reach. Yeah, so... The part that I want to key in on, and it sounded like you had more on switching, so I'll pass it back to you in a second, but sure. <laughs> I think the turnover creation also speaks to the mentality and energy level that we often see when this, these groups are out there. And it's a little weird because that's been a, a weak spot or a, a point of inconsistency for them all year is Vogel's teams often, almost always, force turnovers at a high level. I know this personnel is not necessarily like most vocal teams, but 
you would have expected that they would have emphasized that, and it hasn't always been consistent. But with those groups, it it's it's up there. All those lineups that I mentioned, if you sort out Eubanks, Nurkic, and Azubuki, they are forcing turnovers on almost fourteen percent of possessions. That's in the top part of the league. It's not an elite number, but it's definitely better than some other ways you could break down some of the lineups. And so it feels like when they're out there, the level of activity, the, again, just the mentality to know it's kind of our only chance. We're not going to be blocking shots at the basket. We're not going to be cutting off drives with help defense and all these other things. We, we just need to do this and it feels like they can make it happen. But, um, what, what has to work for, for a switching defense to succeed? And what have we seen from the Suns with that? Well, switching a lot like with, with help, it takes prior preemptive communication. And that's something that this team did not have early in the season. Obviously, work ironing out the kinks with quite literally an entire new roster. And not just a new roster, new defensive principles, all of that fun stuff. So earlier in the season, uh, I go to an in-season tournament game, not the actual playoff game in the in-season tournament, but the Suns were hosting the Lakers in one of the first games where they played them. And they went to switching in the fourth quarter in a small ball lineup, and they were giving up constant three-pointer after backdoor cut, after three-pointer, after um, miscommunication at the, the mesh point of the switch, and that's another pull-up three for Austin Reeves. And I'm looking at that game as a template for a lot of the inconsistencies we've seen from them, switching both on ball and off ball. Now they've done a better job in terms of being more connected there. And I think obviously, like we talked about that Keynes game is an example and a timestamp for this team with their progression in that small ball and switching. But it takes that preemptive communication, like I talked about, having somebody like that is young in those lineups in addition to Royce O'Neal helps because that's one of the biggest things that those two bring to the floor, regardless of the lineup they're in. Master communicators always speaking preemptively, always speaking and let their teammates know what's going on around. So I think it's that part. And a little thing within the switching, something that Kevin Durant does consistently, as well as Royce O'Neal and Thaddeus Young, when they're coming together at the mesh point of a switch, you imagine that almost like the offensive player, they're like swap, they're swapping positions and you want to see the defensive players somewhat passing the baton. But there's a level of connection that you have to have to where you're not conceding the pops and the slips. The best way to be switches, where it's in the kind of Duncan, is with the slip. You cause all types of creation uh, or the chaos, rather, for a defense to sort through. But if you're connected with your switch to where if my man is setting a screen for Brendan's man, if I'm just kind of blase next to him, he can just slide right between us, and now that's creating that reaction advantage. But if I have my hands on his back or on his hip, and I'm literally almost pushing him to the legal limit and passing the baton in that manner to Brendan. He can make that switch. doesn't have to worry about the slip. I can take over for the ball and keep the defense from shell attack. It's hard to do when teams, uh, you have somebody like, let's say, Kyrie Irving, they can just manipulate everything at the blink of an eye. But it's a little thing that has to happen with consistency. And like I said, outside of those three that I mentioned, they don't do it enough. They've been doing better with it, but I think that's something they can improve on. And it's something I'll be looking for going forward as well. Yeah, I, yeah. I think for sure the the young guys on the in that were in the rotation during some of those early season situations, it was just untenable. You could see it. They didn't know what they were supposed to be doing. I think I, personally, I feel like Eubanks is is was a culprit of that. But obviously, we're talking about lineups where he's not on the court, so maybe that doesn't matter. I wanted to circle back to the rebounding though, as well. The games I just went through and pulled the box scores from a lot of the games where I remember them going small. I'm sure I'm missing some. One of them was actually all the way back against the Spurs in one of the games when they lost to them that first month of the season. And Nurkic only played 19 minutes in that game. We remember Durant was guarding Vic at points. And in that game, they lost the rebounding battle. And that's a big part of why they lost by 11. In the game, you saw uh, Nurkic grab 15 rebounds, but... Um, the Suns as a team were able to gang rebound. They got out-rebounded Sacramento by 15. The next Kings game, a little while later, when they also went small late, you had Durant grab 11 rebounds in that one, and the Suns were able... They did get out-rebounded in total, but his individual effort was big. And then even on... We were talking about Wednesday's game, but uh, Tuesday night's game, Royce O'Neal grabs 11 rebounds. So 
it's very easy to look through and see when when those lineups have succeeded when they've gotten a lot of run oftentimes it's because at least one of those players has stepped up i think royce can be uh, a help there too just simply by being a little bigger than the other options the suns had earlier on or at the very least a bigger player who's not uh you know young and inexperienced and making those mistakes but yeah with the switching i always think of those Rockets teams and the way that they tried to guard the Warriors, I feel like they ran a master class in a lot of this on and off the ball, and they made me realize and learn how difficult that is. It's not just saying, okay, you know, hey, you every, know time every time we're going we're gonna to face a, face a screen, a everybody just take the guy that's running past you and, and we'll just work from there. It's, it's obviously incredibly difficult. And since that point, teams have only gotten better at beating it with a lot of the ways Steven laid out. So what I want to talk about next actually is Thad Young in more detail. And why do we think they have not gone to it much at all? Cause I think that's also, if we're thinking about what has to work, like, some of the elements we've discussed are what would make the coaching staff trust it. But I do think it's fair at this point to wonder if there's just a resistance to it, period, and maybe why and, and whether and how it will come out in the playoffs and just sort of look forward. So we'll do that next. First, today's show brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook. It's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Uh, right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 straight to your account, win or lose. I'm looking at NBA odds for Friday night, and I am looking at the Suns-Kings. I don't know if there is going to be an odd because the Kings already play. Let me see what else we have. Oh, there is. There is. The Suns are three-point favorites on the road. I would say that that is all about rest, but there's obviously much more to bet on there. Across all sports, all basketball, everything you love to watch is there. Bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make your first bet an automatic win. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. All right, closing out the show. So why do you think Vogel has been resistant to a two prong question for you, Steven? Why do you think he's been resistant to it after I, I joked, but he was pretty hype about laser lineup and getting into it, felt pretty optimistic about it. It felt like coming off of those Kings games and a couple of those other moments we've talked about. Why do you think he's been resistant to go back to it even since getting O'Neal? And do you count Thad Young lineups as small ball lineups? I guess based on what we've seen and how they've played with him on the court. Yeah, I've, I've remained of the mindset that Vogel doesn't want to be too lenient on Thaddeus Young uh, at, in the regular season stretches. I feel like there's a bit of gamesmanship and not wanting to have too much film on seeing what Thaddeus Young looks like with the Suns um, in terms of obviously teams game planning for them in postseason context, whether that be the play-in rounds or the actual – first round of the playoffs and going forward. So I feel like he knows there's a baseline with that. He's young. You know what you're going to get from him, especially at this age. I feel like he, he thought that there's no need to like forcefully like thrust him into the rotation to the extent that you have with Royce O'Neal, but the age difference, but also with Drew Eubanks, there's still going to be points in the postseason uh, should the Suns continue to advance through that they're going to need minutes to be eaten up from a slightly bigger center in those reserve or reserve adjacent lineups then Thaddeus Young can provide at times depending on the matchups obviously so I feel like he didn't want to just completely up in the rotation show his hand and kind of just keep that spade in his back pocket um, and with Thaddeus Young just looking at him specifically the things that I feel need to pop when he's in the rotation for one is the the up tempo and up pace obviously he's not a rim runner like Clint Capella or someone like that but he can get up the floor a little bit better than obviously Yusuf Nurkic and just as good as Drew Eubanks. And obviously he does it with more skill than Drew. The other thing is defensively, the switching. If he's still able to hold up when he's switching with uh, opponents, like we've seen a couple of times with emergency late switches, the veer back switches in the paint, and then sometimes just this general uh, five out switching, he's able to contain the ball for two, three dribbles. They have protections around him where they're loading up or helping the gaps. 
that keep the defensive shell intact that's solid. I think he's still good enough to get to that portion of the defensive process. That adds the layer that they don't have with obviously use of Nurkic or Drew Eubanks. It's a change of pace in terms of like a curveball in their process that gives them something to make opponents have to try to solve as a riddle. And obviously the activity that comes with it. He's not just switching. We saw yesterday he wasn't necessarily switching every possession, but he was a hedge and recover, got a handful of deflections and steals out of that, and they played in transition from there. So just looking at the uptick in his in the switching when he's on the floor and the activity like we talked about with them um, getting steals and deflections and things of that nature. I hope that you're right about why it hasn't been used more because I could see the argument there, right? Like they they wouldn't have signed him if they didn't want if they didn't think he could help one and two they wouldn't have signed him if Jones didn't know Vogel would at least like the idea of of what he could provide right like I doubt they were on such a different page that James Jones went out of his way to go sign a player who his coach didn't didn't have any use for so it would make sense if it was sort of a break in case of emergency type of thing and it would make sense if hey it's a vet he's basically played in every type of situation every type of thing we could ask him to do he's going to be able to execute we'll have him in the gym for practice and everything else along the way and if i need him for 12 minutes in a playoff game i'm going to feel confident that i can do that now obviously we're in wait and see mode wait we can't really speak for certain that that's the mentality until we get there but I can see that, and Vogel did say something to the to that effect um, after the game. You know, he wanted to see it, and it it wasn't about benching Drew. Uh, also, could have been a little bit of politics there. Drew did play poorly the night before, but we'll see what happens on Friday and beyond. Um, okay, so we just saw it against the Clippers, right, Stephen? We've talked about the Kings. How do you think about matchups? Do you feel like it is something where we will see the Suns do this reacting to an opponent? And if so, do you have any in mind? Or do you feel like it will continue to be something where the Suns proactively throw it out there as more of a change of pace kind of surprise element, like an onside kick coming out of halftime type of thing? Um, if I were to just say... Will it get more minutes reacting to the opponent or throwing the opponent off as a proactive thing? Which which do you think we see it used more in in the playoffs? In the playoffs, that is that's a great question, and it's a great question because we've seen it. I was going to bring up the noticing and paying attention to the timing in which Vogel decides to go to it. We've seen in multiple stretches this season where it's a consistent part of the rotation, where Vogel will go from Nurkic to Eubanks. And then bridging that gap between Eubanks and going back to Nurkic, they'll sprinkle in some Durant at the five. Or he'll do it to end court to end half. So to end obviously the first half and then close the game in the fourth quarters. We've seen it go with that iteration in the in the rotation. We've also seen it like we talked about against the Kings and other teams, where it's a reaction to them getting blitzed in their traditional lineups. And it's like it's fail safe, it's end all be all. If all this fails, I know I got this lineup and it's gonna give us something. And that has to be a middle ground there where you don't necessarily have to have it big specifically into your rotation for this portion of games, but it also doesn't have to be a reaction knee jerk wise to something that the, the opponents are dictating to you to where they're playing your other lineups off the floor. So I personally feel like it's going to be consistently in the rotation come playoff time or come, let me not skip. Let me say postseason time because <laughs> yeah, they still yeah, got work yeah, to yeah. do. Caveat, I think, yeah. yeah, for sure. I think they'll get to where they're using it consistently within the rotation again, and they'll just come across in multiple iterations. And I think the iteration that we see is going to be determining kind of like what's going on over the floor of the game, whether it's, you know, KD with Royce or is it KD with that, or, you know, the laser lineup where it's solely KD and all shooters on the floor. So I think it'll be kind of baked in there consistently come um, after Sunday. What about you? Yeah, what you I, I guess – I, I don't know. I, I, I would, I, the reason I asked it in the first place is because I would like to see them do it more with intention. And so that's why I'm, I'm hoping you're right about the that angle of it and, and any of the other versions we might see because it's too 
it has too high of a ceiling to not roll it out as a confusion. Now, a play-in game, I can see being, as a coach, very nervous to, to do something like that depending on who you're playing but in a in a playoff series you know suddenly it's you know the second quarter of a game two you're down eight let's see what can happen right like I, I would like to see it in in that type of a situation um yeah I, I don't know I, I'm not optimistic we'll see a ton of it no matter what but I think just how much Vogel has gone out of his way to emphasize the importance of Nurkic. And maybe that's just a confidence builder and, and, you know, coaches say things, but I think he thinks that's really important. And I think the length of time he stuck with Eubanks when he didn't need to, all that points to, I don't know how much, I don't think he trusts it very much. And I think the players are going to have to demonstrate that it can work. I think maybe t yesterday, Wednesday can be a stepping stone there, but the last thing I, I just will say, and it's it's kind of obvious, I guess, it's not the most detailed point, but Kevin Durant feels tired to me right now, and I do think that that can't go unaddressed. That it, again, asks a lot of him if there is a bigger player on the court, on the opponent, on the opponent's, in the opponent's lineup, grabbing rebounds, being in the paint generally, contesting more at the rim, even just switching and having to guard more guards in some of those lineups is unnatural for him and asks a lot of him physically. I hope that they don't have to worry about the play-in and that can can settle itself with a week of rest, but that that has to be in Vogel's mind, I think, right? That it's like, how much more can we reasonably ask of this guy who has been available and a superhero all season for us? Yeah. And I, I think I think there's certainly a dynamic of that where you don't want to over overtax Kevin Durant. Now, obviously, come postseason, everything ratchets up to the, the highest notch. And, you know, it, it is what it is. You get multiple days off between games. Obviously, for a player that's advanced in basketball age, Kevin Durant certainly fits the criteria for someone that benefits greatly from it. But I also think yeah. that at the same time, just looking at the Suns, it's something that they're, it's going to have to be a main part of the plot for them to ultimately get to wherever it is that their ceiling is for this season is going to be. Um, I feel like the backup center minutes, we've talked about it. Every, I think we've both written about it. <laughs> we talked about it on Twitter. It's just, it just hasn't shown to be good enough. And you can't um, viably expect for it to be uh, up, to, up to snuff come postseason play. Uh, speaking of the minutes with Drew Eubanks. So naturally, that's going to put you in a bind where it's either Kevin Durant or that is young behind Yusuf Nurkic. And you got you to kind of, you know, splice it the way you can. But Kevin Durant's talked about uh, even more past um, past postseason, getting on-court rest. Now, not, not only was it the difference from last year and this year having Chris Paul and Bradley Beal, obviously Chris Paul is a lot more passive, especially at his advanced basketball age than Bradley Beal. But the beauty of the big three is Kevin Durant can eat up high minutes and still not – overtax himself on offense at times. So if he's sitting in the corner for multiple possessions and he's playing 40 minutes a game in the postseason, I would like to not see Suns fans complaining about him not touching the ball for five or six or seven possessions in a row when you have Bradley Bill, Devin Booker, Grayson Allen, Eric Gordon, Royce O'Neal, they could all do these things in self-creation at times. He's eating up minutes on the floor to get rest so he can then apply himself on defense, especially in these small ball renditions that they're inevitably going to have to use with him featured as a centerpiece. So keep that kind of thing in mind in your back pocket to bookmark uh, going into the playoffs. I think he'll be fine. He's a dog. Dogs are going to want to win. He's not going to want to come off the floor anyway. So, you know, no. if he can catch on-court rest whenever he can on offense, you know, that works to their favor. So, Great point. I mean, he, he played 53 minutes three years ago in a, in a, in a do or die game and was guarding Giannis in that series and had to do way more on offense than he has to right now. So that was three years ago, but that was also post Achilles and everything. So I'm not doubting him. I guess I'm just trying to be careful. And, and I think it will be a balance. Like you said yourself and uh, maybe we'll look back at that first stint with Nurkic resting on Tuesday night as the thing, the straw that broke the camel's back that forced Vogel to just embrace this. I think Sunday's game will be a big litmus test for that. Do they try it against a team that is theoretically big, you know, with Cat coming back and Minnesota in their full size? That will be interesting. I think Sacramento, it's a little more natural. 
and then the play-in, we'll see what happens. But that will wrap us up for the week. Don't forget to hit follow or subscribe wherever you're finding this show. Don't forget to read Steven at Brightside. Follow him on Twitter as well. And we'll catch you guys next week.